<laughs> right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask to turn to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 16, and we're going to begin reading in verse 19, Gospel of Luke chapter 16, and verse 19, the Bible says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate, full of, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in my water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father, Abr Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for our church. Lord, we pray for people that are before us today that they may gain encouragement from the Lord. Lord, that you would uh, convict the lost of their sin, Lord, and that you would draw men unto yourself. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture of the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry. And uh, he was addressing the religious elite. Uh, the Pharisees, one of the groups of the Jews, had a real issue with what he was preaching and teaching others. And their issue was this, that it was uh, not based on the law. In other words, the law did not have preeminence, but whether Christ did. The means of redemption wasn't being good, but rather the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that was culminating, and, and, and in other ways, they had criticized him because he had healed on their Sabbath day, Saturday, and they criticized him from, for this, and all of it was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. All of it was uh, coming to the point that, uh, at least in a carnal mind, they would understand and know who he is. So with that being said, he begins to tell them about this man named Lazarus. Uh, I believe this is a true accounting because in parables, people usually don't get names. And it is not the Lazarus that died and came forth. This is another Lazarus. This was a different individual, but I personally believe it to be a real accounting. Now, I want you to see back in our text in uh, verse uh, 20, the Bible says this, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his, meaning the rich man's uh, do uh, door or gate full of sores. Now, the first thing I want you to understand and know, being poor is not being righteous, no more than rich 
makes you a sinner. Yeah. Uh, those were just given, I think, for our benefit to show us where these men come from. Now, one danger of being religious is that it will, it will make your view different than the lost. Now, it's a wonderful thing to be saved. It's quite another to be religious. Right. Mm. And uh, so we have to be careful because I believe in, uh, that this man, I believe he was a Jew, and I'll show you that by the word of God in a minute, and he may even have been religious. We all automatically assume that this was rich man was a very sinful man, but I don't see where the scriptures really teach that. He was no more or less than a sinner than I was, and, and he may have lacked some compassion, but that's most of us. Now, verse 21 says, And desiring, being Lazarus was needing or wanting, and desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now, this was actually a custom that happened uh, fairly common in those days, and they would pick up the scraps or the things that had uh, fell to the floor, and they would give it to the poor. Now, the best we understand, this did not happen. Um, I think this rich man, like most of us, if we be honest, lacked natural compassion. Have you ever wondered what motivates some to do uh, uh, compassionate things and what motivates others not to? Uh, you know, just because uh, uh, we uh, maybe, maybe not approve of someone's lifestyle doesn't mean that we have to be heartless and mean to them. And, and that was this situation. He could have easily given Lazarus some extra food. And it came to pass that the beggar died. Now, each and every one of us will die. Death is a very real part of living. Death is something that's approaching each and every one of us. The moment we begin to live, we start to die. Right. Now, that, that is a reality that we all must face. Out here in our little cemetery, Donna's Uncle David is buried and I probably met David in 78 or 79. They were living down at Carlisle at that time in a little trailer, uh, him and Dottie Dot. And I never, married, I never imagined I'd marry his niece, but I did. But I, I, knew, him, I knew him well, and back then, David was young. <laughs> and uh, then I married his niece, and we got to know each other better. And uh, then David died. I think he was 63, 5, something like that. Uh, he died. That was, that was the story of his life. Each and every one of us are going to have a story of similar circumstances. And we were very surprised when that happened because he had not really been that ill for that long. And then suddenly he's gone. And the very same thing, death came to Lazarus. Now read the rest of that verse. And... He and, and was carried, meaning Lazarus, by the angel into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died also and was buried. Now, I want you to see their status in society did not, uh, did not change their accountability to death. Irregardless, if you're rich or poor, it really doesn't matter. You're going to die. Right. Uh, you're going to face a death. It's going to be reality. And once we die, what's next? You know, we live in a day, day, a day and age today where that is just a uh, question as much as anything else. Now, when I was young, when I was a little boy, uh, there was no question here in the South when you died, you were facing judgment. Now, a lot of people had different ideas about that and about what it would entail, but death was not the end of things. You know what the most popular uh, lie that's being told today is death is, is about death is that's it. Mm. You're done. And, and you know what? Uh, it's a, that's a great comfort to some people. And you know why? Because with that, there's no accountability. There's no accountability to anyone. And, and so we've seen in, in my relatively short life, in 50 years, 
that has kind of switched about to the denial of, of what that there is life following death. But that, but that is a reality that we must all face. Now notice in verse 23, and in hell. Now, the reality of hell is a most hated doctrine. But we're going to find some characteristics of hell this morning. What makes up that place of the lost? What, what is entailed in that? And, and if you have any kind of spirituality at all, it's a scary thought. It, it, it's a difficult thought to think that even today, the rich man is still there. You know, th this was wrote centuries ago. Right. And he's still there today. Yeah. 2,000 years ago, yeah. an amount of time that we can't even fathom. And, and the Lord Jesus was given this historically, so it could well be more than that. And the rich man remains there even today. That's a very, very scary thought to me. Uh, that, that one third of the existence of our whole world, he's still there even today. And, and so I want you to see that he, uh, that it was immediate as well. You know, the Catholics teach the idea of soul sleep and, and, and being in the grave and nothing happening until the day of judgment. But you know, nothing can further be from the truth. It's immediate. Uh, that body means nothing. Right. It means next to nothing. And, and, and so we see then that in this place called the lake of fire, uh, soul sleep, and there are Methodists that believe that as well, soul sleep is not real. There is no such thing as soul sleep. It's, it's one way or the other. And so we find that that was the situation of this man. And hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, plural, more than one torment, more than one issue, more than one problem, and seeth. Now, I want you to, to look and understand the first thing about hell is that his vision was intact. Uh, he could still see. He could still perceive things. You know, uh, it's a scary thought to be a blind person. And I've known a few in my life, and they couldn't even distinguish light from dark. But this man, after he was cast into hell, that means he saw everything that was going on around him. Now, he seemed to focus on Abraham's bosom because probably it was the pleasant part of it. But he saw people being burned. He saw people in their miseries. He was still seeing everything that was going on around him. And, and, and that's a very scary thought to me. It is that you don't, you know, the only, dis the, the biggest distinction. You remember when he created Adam as opposed to the other, the other creatures that were out there? It said that he breathed in the nostrils of Adam and he, meaning Adam himself, became a living soul. That's what distinguishes us from all other creations. Uh, you know what? Cats don't have a living soul. Dogs don't have a living soul. You know, we live in a crazy day today where they have more rights than we do. I mean, how foolish. You, you, you know why there's cats? And I'm not a cat fan. Uh, take care of the mice. Right? You uh, know why dogs exist? For protection. There, there are reasons behind them. And, and, and they have no living. You know what happens with a cat when they die? They're dead. End of story. Nothing happens. But when, when, when a man dies, when a created human dies... Life goes on. That's right. what distinguishes us from everything else that exists. And, and, and so we find then, it was much the same way with this man. His vision remained intact. He could see. Verse 24, and he cried. His voice was intact. He could still speak. He still understood things. He still followed language. And he cried and said, Father Abraham... Have mercy on me. Now, it makes you wonder 
Did he ever ask for mercy before? That that's an you know mercy in and of itself is a uh, is a good Bible doctrine. Um, it's very close to grace. It's not quite grace, but it's very close akin to grace. And and so he asked for this thing that he never had before. Now, very quickly, I want you to go back with me uh, to verse nineteen of this same text, uh, Luke sixteen nineteen. Uh, the Bible says this was while he was still living. There was a certain rich man which was which was clothed in purple and fine linen. Now I've heard a couple of discussions about why the the garment he was wearing was distinguished. Um, uh, some say it's to illustrate his wealth. But what what was Lydia? Bible says of Lydia, she was a seller of purple, Acts chapter 16. And, and, and what is very much believed concerning Lydia, the prayer shawl for a man in the Jewish culture was made out of linen and it had a purple stripe on it. So perhaps this man called Lazarus was religious. Mm -hmm. Maybe he had a prayer shawl. Maybe he did go down to the temple. But you see, his religion did him no good whatsoever. Because all these actions that, that we see and, and the punishments that he's enduring is a glimpse into his soul and what made him tick and what he was all about. And so we see that his vision was intact and he could see over there. And notice what he does. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, man, your prayer life gets good when you're in hell, doesn't it? And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, I want you to notice one, one reality concerning hell itself is that the flames are real. You know, that is the biggest denied truth today, that, uh, that hell is simply separation from God. Well, the way that I know lost people, they like to be separated from God. Mm -hmm. They have no interest in being near to Him. So the punishments of hell be go, go way beyond just simply being separated from God. And, and, and so we find here that the hell... Uh, the hellfire is real, and it said he was tormented by it. He was burning. He could ex he could experience the pain that was going on, but notice it did not change his character. You know what people in hell today, they still hate people. They still hate Christ. They still uh, wish, that they still uh, think they deserved better, because notice what he says concerning Lazarus. Let Lazarus come over here. Now, if you were in hell, would you want somebody to join you? Yeah. He didn't care nothing about Lazarus. He even saw him still as a servant. Let him dip his finger in the water and, and bring it down here. He, he thought nothing. You know what? That's no compassion whatsoever. You know, it, it's a sad thing today when God's people don't illustrate compassion. Right. Uh, that's like a lost person, is not it? We need to be the kind of people, and understand it, no, I mean, I've, been, I, I, I've had the same thoughts used to when I worked out to the school. Every time I come off the 374 bypass, there would be a hobo uh, right there with the two men. That, I guess the city finally got them out of there and want money. My first thing was, you know what? I'm getting the pavement to get my money, and you're wanting my money. But that ain't, the, that, that ain't the right attitude of a believer. And then when I was rebuked by the Lord, I'd take what little bit of money I had and say, I hope things go good for you. Yeah. And that is having compassion. You know what? I didn't know that man's story. You know what? He, he may have been working hard at train a few months ago and, and saying that he's a bum and a drug addict. It, it's nothing more than making assumptions. Uh, we need to show compassion yeah. to the Lord's people. And so we find the lost man, the, the rich man, 
He had no genuine compassion for Lazarus whatsoever, not in the lifetime when he gave him no food, and not in death time where, hey, I want him to come to hell with me. Either way, no compassion at all. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou that in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things? But now he is comforted, and thou art poor many. Now again, I have to emphasize there's no righteousness in being poor. The, what he was stating was, you remember. In other words, his memory was intact. You know, people in hell still remember everything that occurred here. When they attended church, and when they were in the bar room, when they were smoking pot, everything about this life still intact, even today. That's pretty scary, isn't it? Uh, uh, you know, uh, I wonder if the rich man ever thought about going to temple, about doing it out of root and habit and not meeting with God. See, everything was intact and remained up here. And, and, and so we find then that this man uh, remembered everything. Notice verse 26. And besides all this, Abraham still speaking, between us and you is a great gulf fixed. Now, fixed means in place, nailed down, not moving, uh, uh, never to be, uh, never to be uh, bumped one way or another. It's fixed. It's in place. And, and so we find that this wall, could, you couldn't go through it. Now, apparently, it was visible. You could see through it. But you couldn't move it because he saw Lazarus and he saw Father Abraham and he, he identified who they were and yet and still they couldn't get to him. Mm. You know, is that not true without grace? Do you not know people that have heard of Jesus from the day they were born and still do not know him? That's right. You know, it's fixed, ain't it? Mm-hmm. Are we to continue to preach? You betcha. But are we going to save them? Absolutely not. And many will die in the same uh, situation as this rich man, and they'll see the beauty of it, and maybe see what, uh, from, from man's understanding, see salvation, but never experience salvation. And such was the case with this man. All right, verse 27. And then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Now we find it, we, we suddenly uh, turn, uh, find a turn in the man's attitude and he says, okay, if I can't be comforted at all, go warn my brothers. Now, according to the rest of the text, he had five brothers besides himself and he was concerned about their eternity. You know what? Uh, uh, I don't. Th and, and his exact statement wasn't about their spiritual nourishing, nourishment. His exact statement is so that they won't come to this awful place. Um, just simply preaching the avoidance of hell doesn't re result in much spirituality, does it? Now, should we preach that you bad to hell? Is reality. Listen, lost people, you listen to me good. Hell is a miserable, disgusting, painful place that there is no escape That's from. Right. Yeah. And, and so we find that he gets all this idea about them avoiding hell, but no spiritual concern. Uh, you know what the problem is with preaching just trust the Lord Jesus, say this little prayer, the confidence is in you. Right? Uh, there's no spiritual value in it. And, and, and so we find 
that salvation then is much deeper than that, and it's work of the Almighty and not a work of yourself. And, and, and so we find that this man, even though he, he becomes concerned about his brothers, he's not concerned about their spirituality. He's concerned about their punishment. He's, he's concerned about their physical, uh, their physical condition. Now notice what uh, 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 he says in verse 30. And he, meaning the rich man, said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now, what was the message, of the first message of John the Baptist? Repentance, right? What was the first message of the Lord Jesus Christ? Repentance. And here we find this man, this lost man, say, If one came up and rose from the dead... He will repent. He will be sorry. He will be grieved over his sin if one raised from the dead. But Father Abraham says, no, though one were raised from the dead, they would not repent. You know, when I was a young preacher, it would frustrate me when people didn't understand the gospel. And it would frustrate me when people had no apparent concern about their eternity. But thanks be to God, the Lord revealed that to me. It, it's not my responsibility. Right. Uh, the Bible says this, he draws to me with him. And, and, that is not, uh, and that is not my concern. And so we find that the Lord God knew certainly that this man would not come, and someone did come, the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone did uh, give himself his sacrifice. Someone was raised from the dead, and it still didn't matter to this man. Now, if you will, go with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, uh, the majority of the Revelation uh, teaching us about end times and what's to be expected. Uh, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, the Bible says, And the devil that deceived them were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now, always remember that the devil's biggest thing is to deceive people. Now when you deceive people, you make them believe something that is not true. You make them believe something that is not real. You make them believe something uh, that is not happening. Now the deceiver says this, eternity don't matter. The deceiver says, uh, Salvation is not real. The deceiver it will even say the soul of man is not a reality. It is not something that even exists. The deceiver is in this business. Deceiver, the deceiver, Satan himself, says this is all a waste of time. That's the message of the deceiver. And so we find in the, the foretelling of, uh, uh, of the end times that one day, finally, blessed be the name of the Lord, one day at the end, the deceiver is going to be done away with. Can you imagine a rich, wonderful time when the devil's not to be dealt with anymore? The rich, wonderful time when there's no opposition to truth. The rich, wonderful time that we spend at the feet of Jesus throughout the ceaseless ages. What a wonderful time that will be. I'm anxious for that have to happen. I'm anxious for the deceiver to be put away. Uh, he, uh, I don't know about you, but he opposes me every day. And he's certainly good at what he does. And, and so we find that this will be the last estate of the deceiver. Now notice where he's at, the lake of fire. Uh, uh, the punishment of the lake of fire is about as much misery as I can think of. I guess 
here in this world, the, the thing that I can about compare it to, at least with man's feeble understanding, is lava. Now, can you be imagine being cast into a place like that? Uh, a lake of lava. And not, you know, uh, being burned is miserable. Uh, everybody, most of you, I guess I should say, know my son Matthew. Uh, when he was a boy, he was a pyromaniac. He loved fire. Uh, Matthew, don't you ask for fire, you're going to get burned. And I mean, I always had somebody tend the fire in the house because Matthew was right at the front line. But I said, don't fool with fire outside this house. Well, all the year, he got my lighter somehow, and he set his shirt on fire. Now, he had reasonable enough sense to fall down and roll, like, you know, we've always told him, and it put the shirt out, thanks be to God. And he, well, uh, I think it was his undershirt. It was hot, uh, he took his main shirt off, and then he stomped it down, and he knew me and Don was gonna be upset with him, so he put his other shirt back on, trying to hide the burns from us, and he got in the house, and we had company there, I don't even remember who it was, and all of a sudden, I saw him going through the kitchen, and he was headed back toward the bathroom, and he was crying, I said, Matthew, what's wrong? And he couldn't take it no more, and he ripped his shirt off, and he burned off of here. Uh, that's not even a drop in the bucket. And all of you know Matthew, he's been, like he is now, his whole life, he's tough as a knob. But he was crying. I got him in the shower and we was washing him with cold water and it wouldn't stop burning and it wouldn't stop burning and it wouldn't stop burning. Now, can you imagine being away from the fire and still feeling like that and then being in the fire continuously? That, that, that's no joke. I'm not, I'm not painting a picture for you. I'm just telling you the reality of it. And never, ever, ever being released. Mm. That 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 is the misery of hell, the lake of fire, where this uh, where this uh, person was cast is still there today. Verse eleven, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no more, and there was found no place for them. You know, that's a scary thought, is it not? No place whatsoever. Nowhere to abide to eternity. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books, which I believe is the books that we have here before us, the 66 books of this Bible were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, that book, too, has already been completed. Every person that ever has been saved and ever will be saved in the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, if there's anything that I don't want in eternity is to be judged by my works. Right. Uh, I know what I'm made of. I understand my nature. And you know, this is the sad truth. The older I get, the more I understand it, and the more I'm horrified by it. Right? And, and, and these individuals, many of them standing on a works-based doctrine, is finally going to get what they want. But it ain't going to be as pleasant as they think. Judged by their works. Eric and I were talking uh, this morning before service about going to places and looking at at, at uh, old rock groups is what we were talking about. And the difference, we see them now than we saw them then. And literally, Eric was talking about a certain group, I won't say, you know, ask me later. Uh, and he says they look demonic. And it was, it was groups that we listened to. And I actually went to one of their concerts. And I said, even then, as worldly as I was, I felt uncomfortable there. And even, even those people will be held accountable 
Even those people are in this situation. People judged by their works. Religious elite. Remember in the judgment is given in, the, I think, the Gospel of John? He said, he said, some would say, did I not prophesy or preach in thy name? And he would say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Not, I started knowing you and I quit knowing you. I never knew you. You know, it's a horrible thing when you don't know God. And you know what? There's not one thing that I can do or any other man can do to make you understand God. Remember as the Lord Jesus Christ was witnessing and he had his, he had his group of apostles uh, with him. And he looked at Peter and said, Who do you say that I am? Mm. It was very individual, wasn't it? Mm. It made him specifically responsible. And he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That's, that's how you understand. Uh, it, it is not cognitive. It is not something that you can conjure up. And, and so we find that those type of individuals, both, both ungodly and maybe even with the surface of religion, both would wind up here and saying, your name's not there, you're not here. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in these books according to the works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Now, I've often thought it was kind of uh, odd that they would mention people in the sea. And, and the more I thought about it, the more I, I, I thought about that in a spiritual sense, and, and I don't believe it's just people buried at sea that died in ships and were cast in the sea because there's nowhere to bury them. It was individuals that wanted to get as far from God as they possibly could. Right. And, have, and have a barrier, the sea, between them and God. You listen to me this morning, there's no barrier you can pray place there. there. There's nothing whatsoever that will insulate you from the judgment and accountability unto God. That belongs to Him exclusively. Yeah. And, he, and He will hold us as His people accountable. And so we find that these individuals, these, uh, these people were held accountable no matter where they were. And hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. Now, I was mentioning the, the, uh, the homeless or the bums, whatever you want to call them. Uh, people who don't have nowhere to go that used to bum money. Uh, you know, the fact that they had nothing was of no spiritual value. The fact that you have plenty is no spiritual value. The fact that is most concerning or should be most concerning is that you're accountable to God. Yeah. And there, the accountability is this. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ or do you not? Are you akin to him or do you have no clue? And, and, and so we find then that uh, this accountability reigns far after death and, and, and he, he will uh, make us look at who we are. And death and hell, both those divisions, both those sets of people, if you will, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Now, I want you to see the distinction there, and this is my own opinion. I think the lake of fire is far more miserable than hell could ever be. The lake of fire is more hot. The lake of fire is more real. The lake of fire is more painful than even the hell that the rich man's still in this morning. Yeah. 
Have you ever thought about all the acts of God are eternal? They really are. Him saving someone is eternal. Him even creating someone. In December, December 19th, 1968, at least in man's eye, I became a person. If you really understand the Bible, it's probably in March of right. 68, right? And, and so we find that, that even then he knew me. That's amazing, isn't it? And centuries past, he knew me. No. He, he, he understand, he understood and knew exactly who I was and praised me his name. Somewhere, uh, because of his goodness and mercy, I heard the gospel. Now, uh, a lot of people say election is salvation. I do not believe that. I believe election is unto salvation. But if you've never been saved, if you don't have experiential, experiential salvation, you may be an elect, but it's on down the road. You know, uh, if we're not careful as sovereign grace people, we forget that salvation is experiential. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's what primitive Baptists believe. I literally had a primitive Baptist preacher tell me that there'll be in people in heaven that were elected that, don't, that didn't even know about it. Uh, I reject that completely. Uh, because <laughs> the Bible says this, by their fruits, you will know them. And so I believe the redeemed act like the redeemed. <laughs> now I also want you to see that the final judgment was simply this, names written uh, in the book of life. Uh, you know, some, some gospel songs I can't help but chuckle at. And one of them is... Uh, he wrote my name. Now that's a wonderful thought. If they sang it right, he wrote it there without sin and shame. I never will forget the day that he wrote my name. Well, you don't understand what he's talking about. Right. Because he wrote your name in eternity. He wrote your name before you even knew one plus one. Right. That's the goodness of our God. Amen. So when you began to think about your life, and you begin to measure what's important and what's not. I'll tell you this, the world's going to teach you what matters is money. What matters is homes. What matters is cars. What matter is having a good time. But I've seen enough people to die to know that that doesn't, that really doesn't matter, does it? Right. It really doesn't. I spoke of David, Don Temple, out here in the cemetery. You know how great, how deep his grave was? Six feet. You know how deep President Reagan's grave is? Six feet. Six feet kind of evens everybody out, does it not? So what's important? What, what, does, what does life mean to you? I can tell you this, the only thing that's important in this present life is do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. And if you don't, dear friend, I'll pray for you because uh, you're, in a, you're in a situation most miserable. Amen. 